Hello everyone, we are doing module 5 on scalable shared memory systems. This is lecture number 4 on directory overhead optimizations. So in the previous lectures, we have seen the directory organization that it was centralized, distributed and distributed had again a few varieties. The flat and the cache based were uh, the two organizations of our interest. So in these two organizations, uh, are there any storage overheads? If you want to recollect, uh, we said that the flat memory based had a bit vector and the cache based system had a doubly linked list just as a recap. So now uh, in this lecture we are going to look at uh, the overheads and can we optimize uh, the storage overhead. So this was the uh, directory organization centralized distributed and here uh, memory based and cache based are the ones we are going to focus on. Right. So for memory based what is the storage overhead? So here I have shown a picture of the directory. So there is an associated memory storage, memory data is kept here and with each of these blocks this is the bit vector. Okay, So this is the uh, bit vector for a memory which has got m entries and this is a p bit vector. So horizontal this is sizes p bits. Okay, So how many total memory blocks do I have in the system? I have m memory blocks in the system because I have p processors and each processor has got small m number of blocks. So small m number of blocks per processor, p is the total number of processors in the system and hence the total memory throughout the system is capital M which is number of processors into small m that is blocks per node. So the directory storage overhead for the globally I'm, I mean uh, this directory is divided into small pieces across all those distributed memory banks. But now I am just combining it together and calculating the overhead. Okay, so we have this m1, d1, m2, d2 such combinations throughout the network. Right? So if you have p nodes you have m p number of uh, memory banks and with every memory bank you have a directory. So I have combined all this into uh, this table and just to see that how much is the storage overhead. And for this we will just do some calculations to get an idea. So we will do that on the next slide. Yeah, here to calculate the percentage overhead I incur for storing this bit vector. All right. So assume that uh, one block is 64 bytes and with these 64 bytes of information I want to store uh, information of 64 nodes that is my capital P is 64 and my memory block size is 64 bytes. So with 64 bytes of data, I am keeping information of 64 nodes. So 64 nodes when I say how much information I need, I need to keep 64 bits because one bit for every node, 64 bits becomes 8 bytes. And so overall, I am keeping 8 bytes of information for every 64 bytes of data. So you can calculate the percentage for this, So you, how much that comes out to be. So you can pause the video, calculate the percentage and also solve for the other two. Okay, so the overhead is I am keeping 8 bytes of information for every 64 bytes of data. The same exercise we will do for the next one. Suppose I have 256 nodes, then my bit vector is going to be 256 bits. That is for every row. Here, this is 256, this is 256, this is 256 bits. Okay, so got it? So this is the overhead I am uh, talking about. 256 bits translates to how many bytes? And so I will do 256 by 8 which is so this comes to 32 bytes and we have 32 bytes with respect to 64 bytes of data. Okay, So for storing 64 bytes of data, I am using 32 bytes. So what is the overhead? 50 percent. Okay, So for every memory block, I am using 50 percent more storage to keep the bit vector. Do it for 1024. So 1024 bits. So, 1024 bits becomes 128 bytes and I am using 128 bytes of bit vector for 64 byte data which translates to 
200 percent overhead. Okay. So, as you increase the number of nodes, you can observe that the number of bits required uh, by the directory storage goes very high. If you have uh, solved it earlier, you can cross check for 64 byte data block and 64 nodes, you have a 12.5 percent overhead. We did this 50 percent and it goes up to 200 percent for 1024 nodes. So, percentage overhead in terms of the P term. So, how do I uh, optimize on this will be my next question, right. So, this full bit vector schemes I can optimize either uh, by addressing the P term or by addressing the M term because capital M is that is the number of blocks which is P into small m. So, if I uh, reduce any of these either the number of rows or the number of columns in my directory structure, I can have lesser storage overhead. So, we can address the width term that is the P term or we can address the height term which is the M term. So, reduce the height of the directory or reduce the width of the directory, ok. So, let us start with reducing the width of the directory that is the P term, ok. So, what is this P term? It is storing the total number of bits per block and uh, this bit vector has those bits equal to 1 which are the sharers, remaining other bits are 0. And suppose I have 1024 processors for example, is a cache block going to be cached by all 1024 at a given point of time? Very unlikely. So, normally we see that a block would be cached by 5 to 6 nodes or maybe 10 to 12 nodes and not 1000 nodes, not even 100 nodes. So, all these out of 1024 bits, I am only going to use 10 to 20 bits and remaining are always going to be 0. So, why to keep them at all? So, I do not need to maintain an exhaustive bit vector for doing this. So, what is an alternative? You would say that if I have 5 to 6 or say 20 nodes which are sharing, can I explicitly keep information about them instead of a 1 to 1 mapping bit vector, ok. So, if you want to do this, you have to list the IDs or the addresses of the nodes which are caching this and the easiest way to do is using pointers, ok. To address the P term instead of storing the bit vectors, we think that can we keep pointers to the nodes that is the addresses of the sharers in this instead of the bit vector. So, even if I have 1024 nodes and I keep 10 pointers, I would still need lesser number of bits than the full bit vector. But if I have even uh, say 20 sharers, if you have 20 sharers, then you would only need to keep 20 pointers and each pointer is 10 bit wide. So, 20 sharers, every pointer is 10 bit because we have 1024 nodes in the system. So, overall I am going to need only 200 bits instead of 1024 bits, ok. So, if I have an estimate of the number of sharers, we can reduce this P term, ok. So, suppose I have only 5 to 6 pointers kept or 20 pointers kept, that suffices up to a point, but in this example with 6 pointers, if the 7th request for the block comes, what will we do? Because what I have done is the P term is storing 6 pointers, right? it is pointing to these sharers. Now, this space is full and a new sharer comes, I cannot increase the space in hardware because this is what I have allocated. How do I solve this problem? Because already 6 pointers were kept. So, to keep the 7th pointer, I need to do something and that is called handling the overflow because now we have an overflow, the storage is falling short and I need to devise overflow handling methods. For this, we are going to use the terminology directory underscore i. So, directory and I will put a i here, subscript, which says that a directory is keeping i pointers. If I say dir subscript 5, for easy writing, I can also write the 5 here, not necessarily a subscript. So, dir5 says a directory entry with 5 pointers. Now, uh, if the sharers go beyond 5, we need to do something that is handle the overflow. Overflow can be handled using these 5 methods. The first one is called the broadcast, second is no broadcast, third is the course vector the software overflow and dynamic pointers. We are going to see them one by one. 
and the overflow method is abbreviated at the end. So I will say B for broadcast, NB for no broadcast and so on. So these are the abbreviations for the overflow schemes. So we will start with the first one directory I, B. So I pointers and B is the broadcasting method for overflow. Okay, as the word broadcast says that when you exhaust these I pointers, you start broadcasting the invalidations because you do not know how many more sharers are there. So, I have uh, 5 entries here, I will have po 5 pointers and if there are new sharers getting added to the system, I simply keep an overflow bit and make this bit equal to 1. And uh, once I see that this bit is equal to 1, Whenever a write request comes, I am going to send invalidations to everybody in the system. That is, I am going to broadcast the invalidations because I do not know that beyond these 5 uh, sharers, how many more sharers have been added to the uh, system. So, if the sharers are more than I, then broadcast the invalidations to all the nodes. Because this is semantically correct, even if the node does not have the data block, it will simply ignore the invalidation message which reaches. Negative point it is going to waste your bandwidth. So, broadcast is safe method, but it is going to take lot of bandwidth. The other option is using no broadcast. No broadcast uh, if I employ, then how am I going to invalidate or how do I handle the overflow? Here there were 5 entries 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and the 6th node comes. No broadcast, so I cannot keep information about uh, extra sharers anywhere. These are the only 5 positions to keep information. So, what I am going to do, I am going to delete one of them and keep the 6th sharer in its place because I do not have the broadcast facility available. So, the overflow says that the new sharer will take the place of one of the old sharers and when you delete the old sharer, what does deletion of a sharer mean? That you have to send an invalidation message to the node number 4 and then use its pointer position to store the new sharer number 6. This is good uh, if you have writing type data with limited number of sharers, but if imagine an application which has several readers that is there is one data block which is read by many processors and sequentially right. So, they will keep reading on and off again and again. So, the reading order is say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, then 6, then again processor 1 wants to read. So, what are we doing? We are invalidating each other's data and if there are more readers and more sharers, this method is going to lead to drawbacks. So, widely read data is going to suffer in this particular method. Okay, so, the third one is a course vector where I am going to use i number of pointers and beyond this when the number of sharers increase, I do not use a broadcast or a no broadcast method, but I use the same storage of say 5 pointers. I had 5 pointers and suppose every pointer was 10 bit wide, I had 50 bits available with me. Now, these 50 bits I am going to give a new meaning to them and say that now this bit vector is not a pointer, but a bit vector pointing to something. Now, what could that something be? I have only 50 bits, but possibly 1000 processors. So, now every bit is going to represent the sharing status of these 1000 divided by 50, those many. So, I am going to cluster the number of processors and say that this one bit in my 50 bit vector is pointing to this cluster of processors. That is why the name course vector. So, the vector is not fine that is every bit does not correspond to a single processor, but it corresponds to a cluster of processors and I can have a cluster of size r. So, that is uh, denoted by directory i with cvr. Okay. So, we have r uh, size cluster and when I uh, turn the policy from a pointer to a course vector, we have to turn the overflow bit on. So, overflow bit has to be used here. Uh, so, we will take an example to understand this. Here DIRI means I have I pointers and R size cluster. In this example, I am using uh, 16 processors P0 to P15, P5 and P10 are the current sharers. So, how does the directory entry look like? We have the overflow bit which is 0 that is there is no overflow right now. 
and among these 8 bits which I have, these are the 8 bit entry. So, my 8 bit vector is, was there, I am using half of it to store the first pointer and half to store the second pointer. So, if I want to give a name to this, this will be dir2 because I am keeping two pointers, cv we will see later. So, this is dir2 for two pointers. Right. So, pointer 1 points to P5, pointer 2 points to P10. Suppose a new sharer comes, now P15 wants to read or write the block, now it is a new sharer. We do not have space for the pointer for P15. So, in a no broadcast we would delete one of the pointers and add P15 to it. In the broadcast we will broadcast uh, to everybody keeping pointer 1 and 2 intact and setting the overflow bit to 1. In the course vector scheme, what do we do? We set the overflow bit to 1 and then convert the two pointer space to plain 8 bits, right. So, I have just flattened it out and said that this is my 8 bit vector. And now, I have to cluster the processors because I cannot address 16 positions using 8 bits. So, 8 bits can be used to point to only 2 positions. So, I have clustered them if you can see this is one cluster and each bit will now point to one of these clusters. Our original sharer was P5. So, P5 is pointed by this one which is this bit and P10 was my other sharer, P10 should have come here. Okay, when P15 comes as a new sharer, I do not have space to keep it in the pointer array. So, first thing I do is I flatten this into a course vector and want to remove the concept of pointers. So, uh, all these uh, 8 bit becomes my bit vector. First of all, set the overflow bit. I have 8 bits of information and I have 16 processors. So, every bit is now going to point to a cluster of 2 processors. So, the DIR CV will become two here because I have a cluster of two processors. So, you can see the processors P0 and P1 are now combined inside this boundary saying that this is my uh, one cluster. I have eight such cluster. Every bit is pointing to one of those clusters and a bit is set to one when any processor in that cluster has shared the block. So, here P5 and P4. So, P5 has shared the block but P4 has not. However, when you want to send an invalidation, I am going to send invalidation to this cluster which will internally broadcast the invalidation to both P4 and P5 because we do not maintain information at the level of the processor, but we maintain information at the level of the cluster. Same thing here, if you see this bit is equal to 1 which points to this cluster and here only P10 is sharing. However, we are going to send an invalidation to all nodes within this. So, I hope it is clear that we have a set of pointers. When pointers fall short, you convert that bit uh, availability into a course vector and accordingly form the clusters. Right. So, with this new course vector, how do I handle P15? Now, P15 is my new sharer and I will turn this bit to 1. This is how I am able to handle almost all the processors in this course vector. So, even if all 16 become sharers, I can still use the 8 bit course vector to handle the information. So, we will uh, take an example where I have dir8 and I have put a, a question mark before cv because you can find out the cluster size. You can pause the video and try to solve this yourself. We have 8 pointers and my system has got 256 nodes. So, what is the cluster size? So, we have 8 pointers and what is the size of 1 pointer? 1 pointer for a 256 node system is 8 bits. 1 pointer is 8 bits and 8 pointers will become 8 into 8 which is 64 bits and plus the overflow bit. So, I have the overflow bit and then a bit vector of 64 bits. In this, I can store either 8 pointers or I can store 64 bits of a course vector. So if it is a course vector, I have 64 bits and each of this bit is pointing to how many uh, processors that is cluster of what size? 
So you have 256 nodes and you have 64 bits. So you can calculate that to find out what is the cluster size. Okay. So that uh, comes out to be 64 clusters and 256 by 64. So that comes to 4. Hence, uh, I will say DIR 8 CV 4. So this is uh, solved again on this same slide. We have 256 nodes, 8 bits per pointer, 64 bits and uh, that gives us 64 clusters if every cluster is of size 4. The next overflow scheme is using software. So here I say SW for software. It uh, essentially says you have to keep up to i pointers I can maintain with the directory and any overflow that is new sharers will be handled by software. For example, I have i pointers, the i plus 1th sharer comes. I do not have space to keep its information. So what I will do, this new sharer plus this old i pointers, all of this information I will take and keep it in the main memory. Okay, And then I know where I have kept in the memory and I free up my bit vector. So my bit vector is now empty to keep fresh new i pointers and I have i plus 1 pointers kept in the memory. And in future, whenever I need to invalidate or access the sharer information, I'm going to uh, use software interrupt routines to do the job for me because these software routines will go to the memory, find out the list of uh, pointers or sharers and then uh, send the invalidations, etc. So handling of overflow is done by software and definitely we have to also set the overflow bit in this case. What is the disadvantage of this? Whenever I have a software scheme, I need a processor to run it because it is not done in hardware. So every overflow will result into an interrupt to the parent processor which has to invoke this interrupt service routine which goes to the memory module, fetches the pointers, maybe i plus 1 or several such because I would be already keeping it inside and then uh, handling the case. So the software overflow schemes your negative point. What is that negative point? I need uh, a interrupt service routine. So we need to trap to the processor which involves the processor occupancy. We are unnecessarily disturbing the routine processor job to handle the overflow and it is going to add to latency. This is implemented in the MIT ALY processor, the software based pointers. It uses 5 pointers with 1 overflow bit and these are some statistics of the delay which get added. So overall uh, the software idea is going to add disturbances to the routine processor and going to add to the latency. So can we do the same thing in hardware? So the next idea is uh, DIRDP which is for dynamic pointers. Overall the same uh, theme as SW but here the uh, hardware is doing it. So I will have a dedicated uh, hardware processor. So I will call it a protocol processor implemented in hardware which is going to uh, manage this list. So in the memory, if the directory storage, this is my bit vector, if it falls short, it is going to point to some location where extra information is kept. and all the things which were earlier done by software that is go here, read this list out and send the invalidations will now be handled by a separate protocol processor. Okay, so this uh, idea is implemented by this Stanford flash processor. Here there are no interrupts to the parent processor and hence we have less overhead. So we have seen several of these overflow schemes. And so which to choose will be the next question. We have looked at broadcast and no broadcast. They are uh, not very robust because no broadcast ends up deleting old sharers and broadcast takes lots of latency. Okay, it has its own trade-off and performance effect. So they are not very popular. Then the general consensus is about full bit vectors because I have uh, fixed information, how much uh, invalidations to send and so on. Uh, so full bit vector is more popular. The other uh, scheme is the hardware based overflow management where the hardware protocol processor takes care of storing the extra pointers in the main memory and then handling the further invalidations. Okay. So this, these two are not very robust. We want uh, full bit vectors which are uh, performing reasonably good. 
the other candidates is the hardware based overflow force vector is also good but here you need to handle the accuracy of the overflow that is when overflow occurs we need to do that properly so hence dynamic pointers is another popular method to handle the overflow all right so that was uh, handling the p term now we'll start handling the m term again the same picture i have shown the m and the p here to set the context so we have handled the p by shortening the storage or the width now we are managing the height term how do i reduce m because m is the total number of memory blocks and i need to keep information about its sharers how can i reduce m at all well the observation is that not every point of time all memory blocks are being cached so the total number of cache entries even if you look at the cache sizes it is going to be much smaller than the amount of memory so your cached uh, this cache entry sizes is much smaller on top of it if i am talking of a particular block the total number of sharers of this block will be even smaller than the total memory size so why to maintain one entry for every memory line can i construct a cache to do this job because uh, most of the time 98% of the directory entries are sitting idle to solve this i am going to propose that we can use a directory as a cache and when you make it a cache you can store it in sram instead of dram which is faster so your access becomes faster by making it into a cache now how do we do this here not all these entries capital m and number of entries are in use most of the entries are unused so only those entries suppose i'm using these two you maintain a directory for only those memory blocks which are getting cached and shared okay for the other memory blocks we don't need to keep information and uh, you will observe that if i have this big enough i am able to handle all the fresh accesses which are coming in case the cache becomes full we have to replace one of the entries using some policy when i replace an entry suppose this is one entry which i want to remove then that address or for that address whatever are the sharers i need to invalidate them so that i can remove this entry and make space for the new memory block to sit there the directory cache has a single entry and it is size is just one we don't want uh, special locality because there is no special locality in this so there is no special locality cache every entry is of size one this is the same cache used by all the processors because we have constructed a cache for the directory if you distribute it uh, it's possible but you need to handle it separately but if you imagine that this cache is one central cache storage you come uh, to this as a point of reference to read the sharer's information this cache is popularly called the sparse directory because it is a directory but keeps information of memory blocks which are sparse that is lesser blocks information is kept here if i have one directory with several processors it is going to create a bottleneck but you can make it larger you can also increase the associativity so that you have less conflict misses and manage that sparse directory which is a cache properly so that we can reduce the overhead of the m term so to summarize we have looked at directory organization centralized distributed distributed was a uh, flat memory based and then flat cache based and distributed hierarchical so we have seen overview of four organizations then for flat organizations uh, we said that there was lot of overhead in terms of the m term and the p term we reduced the p term by having lesser bits stored and then had several overflow schemes discussed for the m term that is the height term we discussed to store using a sparse directory instead of one entry per memory block okay so with this uh, we finished the optimizations on storage thank you so much mm -hmm.